You're listening to Paris Search Radio. News, views and reviews from the world and the paranormal from across the UK and beyond. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web. Paris Search UK Radio. Paris Search Radio, broadcasting to the UK and beyond. The views and opinions expressed by presenters and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Parasearch Radio or its affiliates and sponsors. Listener discretion is advised. Good evening and welcome to the Paranormal Pop-Up Show. My name is Kerry Greenaway and tonight I am joined in the studio by Mr Paul Rook. We've actually managed to dig him out of his hole. Good evening, Paul. Hello. (coughs) Wonderful to be out, I'll tell you. Honestly, you've been hiding far too long. I know, I know. You keep finding me. It's terrible. (laughs) I keep hunting you down like the dog you are. (laughs) Um, We also have... The lovely Kaz Rooney. Good evening, Kaz. How are you? Hello, I'm good. How are you? Not bad at all. Not bad at all. And we're also joined by Mr. Carl Hutchinson. Good evening, Carl. Good evening, Kerry, and to Kaz and to Paul. How are we all? Oh, we're all doing brilliantly. Anyway, pop-up show, Saturday night. We are talking um, about all sorts of things, apart from... The paranormal, really, <laughs> tonight. Although it does touch a little on the paranormal. Um, on the 15th of April, in the early hours of the morning at 2.20am, the Titanic hit an iceberg and sank. And tonight, we are having a look at the Titanic and some of the myths and legends and experiences that surround the Titanic. Um, Now, I would just like to say we're no experts in this and there are lots of different myths and legends and conspiracies surrounding this particular topic. But we thought we'd have a good old chinwag and commemorate this disaster as at the time it was one of the worst maritime disasters of all time. Now, before we begin, I have to play this. I have to, because it conjures up such a lovely image. Hands in the air, everybody. Sway. Get your lighters out. (laughs) They're actually doing this. (laughs) Oh, dear. It was one of the biggest money-making films of all time at the box office. Um, However... There were a lot of inaccuracies in that film, although at the time it was billed as one of the most accurate accounts of Titanic sinking. So tonight we are actually going to have a little look at the Titanic and see what we come up with in regards to all sorts of areas in this one. So first of all, guys, how much do we know about the Titanic? Because I think it's a subject that fascinates quite a lot of people for lots of different reasons. I know a little bit about it, to be fair. Not, I wouldn't say I'm an expert at it or anything, but I, I know quite a few facts. Not little bits. Yeah. I know, um, I'm, as people probably don't know, in this field, uh, I have the whole conspiracy aspect that I look at and get myself into. So I know a little bit and I enjoy looking at it, so that's cool. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's almost like a, a little hobby type thing, you know, just like reading about it and stuff. It's always fascinating, I mean, the Titanic. It is a fascinating topic. I mean, I know it's an horrendous um, disaster that happened. Yeah. But I have to say, I think from the build right through to the aftermath um, in regards to the Titanic, so much 
about this is so wrong for a start, but you also have to put it in context of the time. I think people go, oh gosh, you know, that's the, it's awful. It was awful, huge loss of life, lots of people at fault, um, and attitudes towards certain circumstances that happened were, you know, in, incredible with this story. And I think that's what keeps the legend enduring. Yeah, I mean, there's new things coming out all the time about the Titanic. Um, it's only recently that I was told about the fire, fires that was quite common in steamships on mm. the um, <laughs> in the coal bunkers, and apparently there was one on the Titanic, and I, I didn't know nothing about that until probably I don't know, two or three years back now. Yeah. Um, so that there's new things coming out all the time. But I, I don't think we're ever going to know the definitive truth of all these theories coming out. Well, I think there's so many um, good research that's been done since they found the wreck. You know, I mean, I think James Cameron was actually quite integral in that. And he was he had yeah. a huge interest in the Titanic way, way before the film, um, he made the film. And actually that... At, made a lot more people aware of the horrendous circumstances. Oh, Andy M and Jose are in the chat room <laughs> already. Good evening, guys. Um, you know, I think James Cameron did a huge amount of work and actually brought aspects of the sinking in a more realistic way in, in regards to the film um, than it was actually quite horrendous when you actually witnessed how the ship split into two and then the bow went down. And I think that was... Even going back to the early original film, people hadn't really um, understood it until that time. Which, which I agree completely with, but I think one of the biggest myths about it is, from the film's point of view to actually what happened, is this whole majestic, the, the boat went up, it broke, and it sailed into the sea, into the darkness. It broke up, it was lovely... The, the actors said goodbye to their other co-hosts while holding <laughs> on a, on a bit of Don't let that. go! I won't let go! Isn't exactly. it the famous thing? And then she and lets him go. Still, <laughs> and there was still room for two of them on that door. Oh, I yeah, think so was, too. I think she was like, no, I'm doing my nails. Sorry, no room. No That's room at the end. a completely end. different story. <laughs> but the, the thing that fascinates me about it is when you look at the actual records and how the, sh the the front part and the back end or the bow and the stern depends how nautical you are how they lie and how how they are now in situ down on the seabed floor and what sort of state they are because a lot of people think it broke and it was lovely and it went down but the speed that the front end hit the sea deck to the speed the back end hit the sea deck, so the damage that was created is is amazing. Yeah, I I, um, I was told that um, it at the point where it hit the the bed the floor seabed, it went. I think it was eighteen meters down. Yeah, about three. I think it's. I'm not 100% sure because it's been a while since I looked at it, which I know that shouldn't say on my vet radio, but I think that the, the front end to the back end is a, a good two and a half, three miles apart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so let's start at the beginning with the Titanic. Let's have a look at the building of the Titanic because, as I say, there's loads of myths and legends surrounding this particular topic. Um, and, Andy, don't worry, I will add you in in a little bit. Okay, so... <sighs> it took two years, a little over two years to complete this. Yep. Yeah. Thousands of men. The mm -hmm. cost is equivalent to over £100 million in modern day terms. Correct. Yep. Yeah, I, I see somewhere that it was, I think it's £7,500,000. <laughs> but you've got to remember, you've got to, to you've got to the remember they were building two ships. Mm hmm. Yeah. That's true. It was built at and the it... Harland and Wolf shipyard in Belfast. Yep. Alongside it... the sister ship, the Olympic. It took 20 horses to transport the main anchor. 20 horses? Yep. 
That's 20. a big old anchor, isn't it? It's a, they're probably big old horses as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they ain't going to be Shetland ponies, are they? <laughs> no, there was 246 injuries and two deaths recorded recorded during the ship's construction in Belfast. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because Kaz, it was it was built. It wasn't built the modern standards that we'd have built yeah. the short ship. This thing was hand built. This built, thing yeah. was beaten. Yeah. So there's going to be accidents. There's going to be injuries. There's going to be deaths. Mm-hmm. God, they're building two boats for God's sake, and these things are huge compared to the time period when the boats were very, very much. So you're you are you're basically welding heat in metal. There's going to be accidents. There's going to be deaths. It, the place is just going to be alive with emotion now and then. Imagine the hard work that went into it. I mean, you sweat blood and tears and toil going to a ship of this magnitude, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I see a documentary about, obviously, the building of the Titanic, and they said that they used substandard um, bolts and... The rivets, wasn't it? Metal plates and, yeah, pretty much everything was substandard. Um, And I think that sort of gave rise... I think that gave rise to the whole... um, theory of it being an insurance job yeah well in, no not initially when they planned to build it it was supposed to be a longer build than it was um but then this thing that is the crux behind the titanic the unsinkable ship the the fastest recorded um voyage between uk and america and yeah. then obviously things then sort of like sort of progress from there so initially it was supposed to be built to the highest standard i am pretty sure that there was corners cut Mm. Mm -hmm. and the whole what paul just said about the insurance claim that brings you to the accident the sister ship that was launched first Mm -hmm. had before the titanic actually got launched well, there Didn't, are three um, million just, just, going on the, the rivet thing. Fall off. Oh, I don't know about that. I'm sure it was the propeller that fell off the sister ship. Mm. Um, the sister ship, the Olympic, had several problems. Um, one of the biggest one was initially at launch. Then it it had an accident to do with its propeller, which Paul is correct. And then on top of that, it also had a collision as well. Well, yeah, it there collided was... with a tugboat, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, well, it didn't. It missed it by four four meters or four foot. There's a big difference between the two. So right. the tugboat captain insurance job is like you hit me. <laughs> yeah. Well, there were three mini, million, three million rivets. Now, this is one of the theories as to why the Titanic sank um, that was used in the construction of the hull. Um, unlike many ships built at the time, which used strong steel rivets, those used in building the Titanic were a mix of iron and steel. And this is where they're saying that there were substandard rivets that were used, um, which basically it wasn't hit by an iceberg. Those rivets actually gave way it caused a weakness in the hole under the pressure of the um water and speed and that actually is what caused the rip it's one of the theories out there i'm not saying it's right i'm just saying it's one of the theories that is out there i've not heard that theory that's interesting (laughs) (laughs) see andy and we have done our research on this i will add you (laughs) I've heard every other theory about the sink and the Titanic from the most whacked out, and I will just say this to Mark Manley, alien type of... <laughs> yeah, it was an alien ship that was an really? underwater yeah. one that hit the, ti- that hit the Titanic, about, I know. There are some weird ones in there. I've heard about the rivets giving away, which seems quite logical when you look at it from a, an engineer, being somebody that is in the steel industry and knows... Steel, yeah, you can sort of think that, yeah, that's probably more than little green men jumping on board and crashing it into something. 
Yeah, so another plausible explanation, I, I think, is that the fires that were in the coal bunkers that were allowed to burn, it's apparently in steamships, it was quite common that they would catch fire occasionally. Yeah, mm-hmm. and imagine it, the amount. Some of the bulkheads. Would yeah. weaken because doors. of the, the heat of these fires. Exactly. And that would also have an, an impact on some of the bolts and stuff. And also you've got the, the, the watertight doors that were known to stick. Yeah, fail. apparently you buckled, um, the, one of the fires in there buckled one of those doors. Well, you, um, th- you, you think the speed that thing was doing and the amount of coal and the amount of heat and yeah. the amount of energy that was being shoveled into these engines... There's going to be accidents. There's going to be things. These guys were 24-7 shot, shoveling coals into these furnaces to make the steam, to make it, to power this thing. And you think apparently, that... Apparently, apparently there were 600 tonnes of coal a day hand-shoveled into furnaces by a team of 176 men. Yeah, so but you, you think you think before that left, how much coal was on board? Yeah. That boat was heavy. Did you yeah. know there was actually a coal strike and they had to go to other shipyards to get the amount of coal that was needed for the journey? It hardly seems worth it, really, does it? Could you imagine mm. the Especially panic? You know, <laughs> Can you imagine the panic of the people that go, oh, my God, we've got to launch on this day. We haven't got enough coal. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it would be an absolute nightmare, wouldn't it? I describe the tank a bit like a swan. Looks beautiful from above, but down below, these things are working fast. Oh gosh, and yeah. For how for how these boats at the time, how these ships or whatever vessels or whatever you want to call them, how these things worked, the amount of coal, the amount of manpower, twenty four seven for for the period of time to cross between UK and New York. That's constant work. That's constant mm-hmm. shoveling. That's constant material being fed into these boilers, these engines to fuel it, to burn it, to turn the turbines, to turn the propeller. Uh huh. There's a lot of there's a lot of sweaty, horrible shit going on. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to swear. No, that's okay. It's marked as explicit. <laughs> so absolutely fine. <laughs> I'm sure there's a f- more than a few people that swore on the Titanic. I would say so. I would, I would say, say so. so. <laughs> <laughs> I think there was a hell of a lot of swearing that was going on. <coughs> now, the journey so, so of... Perry, yes. Let's go back to the, the, the initial bit. This boat's been built. Yeah. You've got a sister ship that had an accident, which Olympic. is documented. Yep. And then... It left, it went, it did a tour of the UK yep. before it set off, which I, I don't think a lot of people, because obviously in the film it left Belfast and it was across the Atlantic. Mm-hmm. This thing left Belfast and did a tour of the UK before, and France before it... I, I thought I thought it went from South uh, from Southport to... Southampton. Uh, uh, Southampton, even yes, yeah, and it went over to, to Jersey, Jersey. It was, it, no, it, no, it actually got launched at Belfast. It then went to Southampton. <coughs> it then went over to Cherbourg. It yeah. then went to some I can't remember somewhere else, and then it went to New York. So it had other stops, as it were, <coughs> along the way. Nobody ever talks about those. No, because that's not the interesting. Because thing, no, is it? they're only interested in the disaster bit, aren't they? Yeah, but at the end of the day, from the moment this boat got launched to go from Southampton to Cherbourg to other places, in modern days, that's pretty quickly. But in those sort of days, oh. that's probably going to be a week, a week and a half. Yeah, it went to, sorry, it went to Southampton, where the initial intake was. Yeah. Um, then it went to Cherbourg, Queenstown in Ireland. It actually went to Queenstown in Ireland um, to pick up another load of passengers. Then it went to New York. Um, and then the return journey was the, the same, but reversed, obviously. Yeah. <coughs> never did that bit, though. But never, nobody ever talks about that. You don't see that in the DiCaprio and Kate no. Winslet film. Well, it's, not, it's, got, a bit, it's, it's not, not the bit they want to look at, is it? It's not the important bit of the journey. 
It took 471 miles, which was the distance of the journey to deliver the Titanic from Belfast to Southampton. 471 mm. miles. So it had already done 471 miles before it went on its maiden journey. So, you know, it's testing out systems and stuff like that. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. And making sure that everything's okay. And the actual ship itself, if it hadn't have had its incident, whether that be hitting an iceberg or whether it was the rivets at fault or whatever it, whatever it was, yeah, then... There's no reason that the actual ship itself was fine. Oh, this ship was supposed to be the most amazing, the most modern, mm. the most incredible floating ship that's ever been produced. Oh, you know, the interior was taken from, um, was inspired by the Ritz in London. Mm. Oh, yeah, the Ritz reception with the the the, stake, <laughs> the the staircase at the Ritz. You go into the Ritz and it breaks out and it goes up. Wooden staircase and it goes up and it's like a double staircase. And mm-hmm. that was yeah. the main staircase, as you see in the film. Exactly. That's an awesome staircase. I'm just going to put that out there. And, that was an awesome uh, they've staircase. Got a replica, they've got a replica of the staircase in one of the museums. Have they they've not? got the replica in the one in America the Titanic Museum in America, but they've also got a replica, a smaller replica, which you can't actually walk up, but in Belfast itself. Okay. Mm. Now, the on board, so, you know, we're talking launch. I'm (coughs) trying to add you, Andy, but for some reason Skype is saying that you're not online, okay? There were 2,223 people aboard the Titanic for her maiden trip. That's 1,324 passengers and 908 crew. She was not filled to capacity. Wow. No. Believe it or not, she was not filled to capacity. And bearing in mind, a big part of this disaster and the, you know, the, the aftermath was about not enough lifeboats um, for the passengers she wasn't even filled to capacity. So can you imagine how much worse? He doesn't believe me. I'm sorry, but I've tried adding you four times. But do you know something, Kerry? The 14th of April, there was actually meant to be a lifeboat drill and it got cancelled. Yeah. I read that. I read that as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I the can't ma- remember where I read it, though. The maximum Nobody capacity. Nobody knows why it just got cancelled. The maximum capacity for the Titanic when she was fully loaded with passengers and crew was 3,547. Wow. That was the maximum capacity. If she, You can imagine how much worse it could have been. <clears throat> Absolutely. And did, didn't they have only like 20 life um, boats when they had, had a capacity for about 64, I think, something like that? They didn't put them all on. Because obviously they thought it was unsinkable. Yeah, but it also came <laughs> to the people that had cabins that didn't want to spoil the view. Yeah. Okay, so but that backfired, didn't it? <laughs> mm. It certainly did. Now, um, okay, guys, if you wouldn't ah, oh, see now you're online. God. <laughs> no, no, it's Andy. And now he's on bloody line, right? That call me out. I know what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm tried to. I've tried to add you four fucking uh, times. You These were trying to keep me out this conversation because I have all the answers. <laughs> yeah, right. Because I'm like that, aren't I? <laughs> Good oh, evening, Mr. Mr. Mercer. A, a, re- a, a resident smarty. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Smarty <laughs> Pants is now in the studio. Yeah. So everybody shut up. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, guys, it's a really funny co- coincidence. I was just watching the program on the Titanic, and this guy is basically explaining why it sank. Not so much to do with rivets and metal or anything like that, but the actual atmospheric conditions at the time that he spent decades researching and has uncovered some very interesting facts about the way in which two different air currents met at the same time to create a mirage type effect. He explained how the effects occur and how it can make the sea level appear to rise. So it could actually appear as if the stars have dropped and then you can't see 
things like icebergs close by, how the Californian was selling only 10 miles away, but because of the light distortion, because of the different layers of heat and cold, it was causing um, the lights to flicker randomly rather than appear to be more as good as it was supposed to be. It comes down to a thing called the Labrador Current, which is incredibly cold, which is then coming down slowly but surely into the Atlantic, and it meets warmer water, and the two merge, and they create a bubbling effect in the air, which then creates the mirage effect you see on a very hot day. So basically everything was distorted and the even some of the survivors described actually seeing the stars seem to twinkle more than ever seen before and they couldn't understand why. And people on board the Titanic itself, some of the watches, were saying that it was like a weird haze in the distance that they couldn't quite make out exactly where the sea ended and the sky began. So there's lots of strange distortions going on. So they couldn't really see properly what was going on in terms of what they were sailing into. And so the iceberg appeared pretty much invisible until it got fairly close to it yeah and then by that point it was too late to do anything about it they couldn't still and couldn't turn because both the light people the the using the morse code signal from both the titanic and the california could see each other but both said that what they were seeing didn't make any sense it didn't seem like morse code it's like random flickerings of light and the guy in the program was saying, if you go out on a, a warm night and look into the distance, your lights appear to flicker because of the heat haze that occurs. But the haze happens not just with heat, but also with extreme cold. Mm-hmm. And that was the reason why they couldn't see properly. And it was absolutely fascinating. The guy's got all the scientific data. He's actually dug down into the records because all ships that sailed across the Atlantic have to take temperature readings every four hours of both water and air and they were noticing ships that were in the area where the Titanic sank had noticed a dramatic drop in temperature in about the same area where the Titanic actually sank I'll so could that. they explain why that <laughs> ship ignored their, their um, absolutely because yeah. they would have thought it had a flickering star as opposed to a well, signal what the guy thought he was seeing was a flickering light on a ship it wasn't a Morse code because he couldn't read it. it didn't make any sense but one of the things yeah. the guy pointed out on the program and he actually showed video footage of a ship um, off of Finland having the same strings distorted effect it was actually a large oil tanker that in the distortion because of the heat haze or the cold haze looked much smaller and then seemed to turn upside down and he said it's because of the different temperatures of the air creates a, a lensing effect so what the captain of the Californian was describing was a far smaller ship he thought it was just a similar ship to his own that was sailing past not he said it was nowhere it was a Titanic it was too small but if his distortion was making the ship appear different to what it actually appeared like it would explain why he was not didn't think he was looking at the Titanic and actually he thought he was looking at a different ship. So it's absolutely fascinating stuff. The other thing he found is that if you look at the records of the ships that were sailing in the air around the same time the Titanic had sunk, which hadn't been looked at for 100 years, you could pinpoint where the Titanic had sunk already because ships were reporting seeing bodies floating in the water, actual people who obviously wouldn't have gone very far from the ship actually sunk. And when they compare the coordinates of these ships right when they saw the bodies to where they now know the Titanic was, it was there. So they could have found the Titanic decades ago if they looked in the right places. These records were stored in um, marine sort of museums and research centres, just tucked away down in the basement, hadn't been looked at for decades. And yet the, the guy found the records and they're there. Absolutely fascinating stuff. It is so fascinating. I mean, there's... Then. Sorry, Kaz. That would explain <laughs> then why there was only 37 seconds between them seeing the iceberg and colliding with it. Absolutely, yeah. It was distorted. It appeared to be far smaller. Wow. He was talk- the guy who was doing the program was talking to people who sail that Labrador coast area, and they said that's the one thing they're always aware of, especially at night. You have to be very careful because it can, an iceberg can suddenly appear from nowhere because the distortion of the water level appears to suddenly drop, and there's a much bigger iceberg appears. And he said the other way around, you can look far off, and it appears to be stretched up. And the guy, the guy showed video of this weird cold water distortion where things appear to be much higher like an island appeared to be like huge cliffs until they got close and it was just a flat island it was just the way in which the water is distorted by the different layers of air where they, they make they mix and meet so yeah basically it appeared to come from nowhere because it was hidden pretty much in, in the mm. near black night sky wow but you've also got to remember on the titanic they didn't have gps they didn't have um mm. radars they didn't have that, that technology that people have today Mm-hmm, absolutely, it was eyeballs. That was it. That was all they were yeah. reliant upon. It was two guys up in a <coughs> mast 
area which I, on a lookout, uh, wasn't it? Which I agree with, but at the end of the day, you say the Titanic, I would say the ship. Was it the Titanic or was it... Uh, was it? <coughs> oh, are we going into conspiracies? <laughs> yeah, Sorry, but that's, that's what I've looked at. And I know. Yes, the accident itself, everything the in the accident's point of view was completely and utterly strange. Um, it as, was the Titanic that went as down. Andy's, Titanic. As, as Andy mentioned, it was like lights, their different type of atmosphere, weather conditions, etc., etc., and ships that were near. But was it the Titanic that sank? Was it a sister ship, or was it some other reason that the, this ship sank? No, I see. I'm. I actually believe. Uh, I am a hundred percent convinced it was the Titanic that sank. Yeah. The confusion with this one comes up with the media perspective. Bearing in mind, on the launch, there was ninety um, people at the Olympic launch, but there wasn't that many at the Titanic launch. Believe it or not. Only when they they sailed from Southampton. Now, because they didn't have any media footage of the actual launch of Titanic, what they did was they used images from the Olympic launch and actually got rid of the names of the Olympic and stuff and transport, transpersed it with the Titanic. So if you actually look at the footage, there is no Titanic named on it because at the time they didn't have the launch footage, which is where the confusion and the conspiracy came, comes from. In mm. regards to which ship was it? Because the media footage is actually showing you footage of the Olympic, not the Titanic. Oh, you can put your hand up for a second. I'm still talking. <laughs> <laughs> so there is the conspiracy born there, right no. in a nutshell. Yes. No. no yes, no. that's fact. We, we, There's we only one way to find out. Right. <laughs> we have discovered that earlier, that the launch was... A good, probably a week, week and a half before it left. But there wasn't the fire out around it like there was with the Olympic. And they it had to use the footage. It doesn't matter about that. That's the launch. That's the fucking... Sorry. That's the sailing down. That's <laughs> getting it off the dockyard. Blah, 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 blah. You, you see that. You film it. Great. There's some big slamming a bottle of champagne against the, the thing. It's filmed. It's done. It's whatever. But it went round, it did other things before... But it wasn't recorded by the media, that's the whole point. No, you're wrong. You're wrong I'm not wrong. at Sherbourg, there's footage from the flotilla that came round it of the Titanic leaving all the passengers to go off. And there's still footage that the windows do not match the Titanic that is meant to have left. But conspiracy theorists will only ever look at one particular piece of footage that fits with their theory, and they take the launch of the Titanic, which by media standards wasn't actually the Titanic, it was actually the Olympic, and go, well, this backs up my theory. And that's not a true perception of what it was. (laughs) Correct. Forget, Forget the video footage or the TV or whatever, but you look at the plans... And particularly if you look at the plans of the Titanic and the plans of the Olympic, which has been on TV, and there's various different documentaries you could look at, they had different setups. So you don't need to see the video of it launching or the TV or the recording of it launching. You look at the plans, the, the diagrams of how it was built. There's certain aspects that you see a photo of the Titanic that is meant to have been at Cherbourg or meant to have been at the other places after it left Belfast. And the window consistency around the the, 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 the captain's area is different to what the plans are on the Titanic. I know. Well, but I... Is, there's a theory behind it that it was not the Titanic, it was the sister ship. I I know this theory, I know this conspiracy theory that's come up and actually, like I said before, when we've talked conspiracies, conspiracy theorists do look at facts that fit their conspiracy. They don't look at the overall picture. They don't look at the overall picture. On that night, it is so well documented in regards to real documentation 
it was the Titanic that sank on that night. I do not believe okay. this conspiracy theory in any way, shape or form. Paul. Okay. At the end of the day, there's one thing that I want to mention, and I will shut up for a little while and listen <laughs> to you guys talk. But there's never been... The ship was named. It had a name on the... Wherever it was on the ship. It said Titanic from Liverpool, on the blah, blah, blah. Why have we not seen video... Photograph the amount of clear crystal images that you get from these divers, the <coughs> robots, sorry, not divers, the robots that go down to the wreck. Why have we not seen hard evidence of photos? How can you look at the wreckage of After any, sh- of no, any ship? No, no, no. Exactly. You look at, you look the at paint the does space. kind of wear off a bit. It's salt water. Exactly. So water does a lot of corrosive damage look, over 80 years. But look at the damage to that nothing. wreckage. They brought uh, the bell up. The bell of the Titanic says Titanic on it. Yeah. What more do you want? Exactly. <laughs> you've got to look at the, the state Sorry, the wreckage is in. I don't know who you are, in. mate, actually. The, the, I've, I've, I've got to ask, who is he? Sorry, I don't know who you no, are. No, I mean, don't be disrespectful. No, I don't know who you are. Honestly, I've never met you. Who are you? I'm not being rude. I don't know who you are. It doesn't matter. Sorry, the bottom line me? is... Yeah, the... sorry, mate. I've, I've, I've not actually been introduced. <laughs> right, OK. Well, we'll introduce you. Andy Mayer's a Carl Hutchinson. Carl Hutchinson Carl, is a Carl, thank you. Curry, Carl, I didn't know who you were. Well, being as we wasn't expecting you on the show, I didn't introduce you at the beginning of the show. So, anyway... <laughs> anyway, 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 yes. When you look at the state of the wreckage on the floor... <clears throat> When you look at the state of the wreckage on the floor of the Atlantic Ocean, um, it is in a real state, isn't it? it you, you wouldn't have the the name on the back of the ship, would you, Paul? Um, I, do you know what? I don't know. Um, I know they had, the, had it on the side, didn't they, at the front of the ship? They could have it. They must. They, yeah, I would have thought maybe they'd have it on the back as well. I'm sure. I'm sure it did in pictures. It did have um like from liverpool or something on the back i i honestly don't know the answer to that question to be fair um as to whether or not it's on the ship but and has raised a, a fair point that it is on the bell that they've raised from the titanic when you go to um the any of the artifacts museums and stuff like that it, i don't buy into the theory or the conspiracy that it, it was a sister ship i actually do think and believe that it was the Titanic that sank that night. There's too much documented evidence yeah. in regards to the ship yeah. as to um, what ship it was. I, I do not buy into that theory. I will state that live on air. I do not believe that in any way, shape or form. Sorry, Carl. Sorry to, 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 to disagree with that theory. Anyway, let's go back to a bit more um, facts and fiction... Uh, not fictions, but facts fictions? about... <laughs> not fictions at all. Now, pre... Launch pre people sailing on the Titanic. There was a lot of stories, shall we say, about people having misgivings about actually sailing on the Titanic before it even sailed. Oh, I, 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 I read somewhere that the guy who invented Hershey's chocolate, yeah, Hershey. um, he, he was uh, <laughs> supposed to go on to the Titanic, but he cancelled his trip there's uh, quite a few actually on this one now some of them you can take with what i would say a pinch of salt because people talk in a certain manner um and you have to look at this in a very um mm, what what word is the word i'm looking for i mean look right okay let's look at one there was a guy called um frank j goldsmith now he worked for aveling and porter which was a firm that manufactured steam vehicles. Now, he wanted to go to America. He booked a ticket on the Titanic. And he actually said to his two colleagues before he left, "Um, what about you chaps giving me something to remember you by? Um, And they gave him two pairs of calipers. One was an inside pair of calipers. One was an outside pair of calipers. (coughs) I have no idea what that is. Just saying. Um, And then one of the guys turned around and said, what's the good of you having them? You're halfway across the Atlantic. You'll go down with the boat and down will go our calipers that we've given you as a gift. 
And he said, Mr. Goldsmith said, there's no fear of that. This is a brand new bow. Now, this is a pure, this is where I go, that's pure co- coincidence because it's one of those things you would say as a humour. It's not something that, yeah. you know what I mean? It's, it's kind of like a throwaway comment, <clears throat> shall we say. Mm. Yeah. Having said that, Mr. Goldsmith then goes on the Titanic, goes down with the Titanic and bye-bye calipers. And what Mr. Chandler was saying, he said he was only jesting with his friend <coughs> and he had not actually experienced a premonition, but why would he say something like that? Many a true word spoken in jest is a very common thing said, isn't it? Yeah. I, I, I think it's just coincidence, that, to be fair. Exactly. Now, all of these um, I've got from a Titanic-related case, um, a book called Lost at Sea, Ghost Ships and Other Mysteries by Michael Goss and George Bay. Um, so if you are interested where I got this information from, that's where I got it from. Um, another one was Annie Ward. She was a maid for one of the ladies, a Philadelphia Society figure, Charlotte Cadeza, um, who was on the trip. Now, they, they travelled extensively. They had the money, or Charlotte did, had the money and took her maid with her. Now, um, when they were just about to board the Titanic, her mother said that she didn't want her to make another trip. She said she feared something was going to happen. She couldn't tell you what that fear was, but she actually said, um, you know, I really, really don't want you to get on this ship. I know it's been, you know, breached as the best ship in the world. It's unsinkable, blah, blah, blah. But she said, "I, I think this could be your last trip. Now, Annie, the maid, was actually one of the fortunate for you to find a place in one of the Titanic lifeboats. She actually survived the tragedy. But her mum's precog, if you want to class it as that, sort of is a little weird. When she had never had any misforgivings before in regards to other trips that her daughter had taken with Charlotte. Interesting. But it'd be kind of like us now having a gut instinct about something. We're not always going to have it about everything, but if it's something we feel is really off and we shouldn't do, then we tend to avoid it. So that's probably what happened with her mum. Mm-hmm. Very much so. Very, very much so. I have another one. Tom Sims, he was a merchant seaman who actually applied to join the crew of the Titanic. Got the application, was accepted on it. Now, Tom's mother wasn't very happy about this. She had a really strong feeling about this, about the safety of her son. She was convinced the Titanic was a tragic ship and she insisted that Tom remained where he was and not actually join the crew of the Titanic. She was that sure of how she felt. She visited the London offices of the White Star Line and insisted that her son's name was withdrawn from the Titanic's crew roster. Now, Tom... I know, that's quite strong, isn't it? From, you know, that's how strong she felt about this. Now, Tom, um, as a good son does, um, listened to his mother. Thank goodness that she listened to his mother and actually didn't join it. So he was not part of the Titanic crew. Now, um, you can... the, The trouble with stories like this is a lot of this came out after the event. Mm. So how true are these precogs or premonitions or however you would like to class it? Did people actually have precogs or was it, oh, I told you it was going to be a bad ship after the event? I mean, a lot of people do that. Oh, I told him he shouldn't have gone on that journey or whatever after the event. But don't go to the lengths of actually visiting the White Star Line's head office, basically, and take their own sons. Well, in that instance, though, I mean... Surely there would have been some sort of record made that day that the mother had turned up there. And then when it sunk, they can prove that the mother's actually turned up there and says that her son was withdrawn from the crew. I know know there was a a, a Japanese survivor and when he returned home to um, Japan, Mm. he was um, branded a coward because he should have gone down with the other... um, with the other people. That's awful, isn't it? But then that's mm. so different from what you, you saw in world, the World Wars when people didn't believe in the fight and didn't want to and they had to wear the white feather. Yeah. And went to prison yeah. for, their, for their beliefs. Or they had to join um, the medical corps. Mm. 
I, I was I also um, something I heard years ago about it. Um, the actual crew, once the ship had sunk, they were all made redundant, so they I didn't get paid out. after. I know. Yeah, that there because was... cause obviously the ship sank and their job no longer exists. Hmm. So therefore, hmm. they were all made redundant. So they didn't get payouts afterwards. I know that they were charged for their uniform and wow. families <laughs> were getting the bill for the uniform post... Being washed. ...disaster. Yeah. <laughs> I know that much. <laughs> so, OK, so we, we've done the launch. We've done the, you know, we've done that precog side of it. What's your take on the precog side of it, Carl? Um... It's a difficult, it's difficult one, isn't it? The, the problem you got is um, this is a famous launch. Um, it's everybody's build it as it's going to cross the Atlantic in the biggest, the quickest time, whatever. Um, was there scenarios? Was there coincidences where people felt that they weren't? going to end up the other side and they dropped out and were these experiences written at the time or was they written out after the fact I was going to say this is the trouble a lot of these accounts came out post it's wit- disaster it's about, witness, it's about witness statements isn't it as yeah. Greg Lawson says you you need to interview somebody straight away and judge the witness person and ju- judge how they react of questioning, etc. But these stories that came through, are they written after, before, at the time? Mm -hmm. You don't know that. Well, there is one case Mm. that I came across that actually did document it at the time of premonition. Okay, now this is actually to do with two journalists, which hmm, I think this puts it into a, a, a worrying area. Anyway, when you when we look at journalists, no disrespect to any journalists out there. Now, Mr. Steed was an up-and-coming journalist um, and was talking to a guy called Shaw Desmond. Now, Desmond was attempting to write an uh, attempted to discuss an article, um, but the older man kept talking about his up-and-coming trip on the Titanic. Now, um, Shaw Desmond had not even heard of the Titanic, before he was listening to Mr. Steed. Now, at one point through this conversation and this walk, and this is pre-trip, Desmond drew slightly apart from Mr. Steed and he had this odd feeling. um, And he said, this, and this is a quote, there came to me for the first time in my life, but not the last, the conviction of impending death. In this case, that the man at my side would die within a very short time. It was overpowering and I felt rather helpless. I didn't for a moment associate it with the liner of which he had been speaking, which I actually think is a bit silly because, you know, whatever. Um, Anyway, they decided to go their separate ways and, you know, Mr. Steed went on to the Titanic um, and Desmond actually went home and wrote it in his diary. And then once he heard the disaster had happened, his wife at one point, thought that he had been saved. There were rumours that he had made it onto um, one of the lifeboats. There was a lot of confusion post-disaster about who had survived and who had died. Um, It really was a period of time where a lot of the um, families were waiting for news and not getting a lot of information. Um, So his wife was actually under the understanding that her husband had actually made it onto one of the lifeboats. But Mr Desmond, Shaw Desmond actually turned round and said, I'm telling you he is not saved, he is drowned. And it turned out that he was actually drowned. Mm. Wasn't there a book written about um, a ship sinking well before the Titanic? There was and they a thought, book. And they thought it was like a premonition almost, because the, the ship's name in the book was t- the Titan. That's I don't right. know if the book was called the same, same mm. title. But, yeah, that's another thing that I've heard. Yeah, the book was written um, a couple of years before um, the disaster or the Titanic was thought about, really. Um, And, oh, God, I can't remember details on this. But, yeah, and it wasn't called the Titan. It was called the 
futile or the f it was an F word. Um, no hold on a second, let me look it up. Yeah, that's like, It's going to bug me um, if I don't look it up. <coughs> I, know I should have had this ready, but um, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I do vaguely remember it, and yeah, it's just something that popped into my mind just now. Futility, that's what it was called, thank you. Okay. Um, and again, there are a lot of coincidences in regards to what was written in the book. There are, it's not exact, but there are a lot of coincidences when you look at that and you look at the Titanic. There's a lot, you can draw a lot of um, comparisons between the two. I, I suppose, to, to be fair, if any ship hits, a, it hits an iceberg, it's going to have pretty much the same outcome. So... <laughs> But it's going to be a coincidence, isn't it, rather than a well, premonition? Well, this is where it, yeah, yeah, say, is, it a, is it a premonition? Is it a coincidence? Is it a precog? Is it a um, download from the unconscious collective? Um, is it any of those kind of things? <laughs> you don't know, do you? You know, it's hard to no, say. But I, I, I think... mean, an author will come up with all sorts of scenarios and it could just be coincidence in timing. Yeah, I mean, if, you, if you're going to write write something about a ship that hits the iceberg and it sinks. That That's sort of like the bottom line. So any other ship that hits an iceberg and sinks, you could say, well, it's it's similar. I mean, it's, to it's be fair, like you, you can look at a book, a fictional book that was written and pretty much link it into um, a modern day affair and, and draw, you know, on the sub, same subject, obviously, and draw comparisons mm. You know what I mean? It's a work of fiction, and then the event. Could you draw a comparison between the two if you pick the right book for the right event? If if you know what I mean, where I'm going with that? Yeah, no, you can't. Yeah, I, I get that. I mean, the novel, the futility, um, the wreck of the Titan, or futility, it's originally called the futility, and then she got changed to the Titan. Was actually written in nine in uh, sorry in 1898, which is actually what 14 mm -hmm. years before the Titanic. Mm. That's where I got the Titan from then. Yeah. Cool. Right, so where are we in the in the voyage of the Titanic? So we're sort of in the middle we've done our trip mm -hmm. through Cherbourg and other places and we're now in the Atlantic. Let's okay, go to the hurtling night. Towards, the, to hurtling the, towards this iceberg. iceberg. Um, or yeah. as we've already discussed, maybe there was other explanations for it. Whatever. It is well documented. It was a mill pond that particular night. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah, that's true. Let's have a look at the iceberg, then, everybody. It I've got cold. a, I've got a kind of creepy little fact about this. Ooh. Actually, um, the iceberg was spotted at eleven forty p.m. on April the fourteenth, nineteen twelve, by lookout Frederick Fleet, who proclaimed iceberg right ahead. Fleet survived the disaster and was a lookout on the RMS Oceanic during the 20s before serving in the Second World War. Pranksters placed a pair of binoculars on his grave in 2012 with a note saying, sorry, they're 100 years too late. That is horrible, isn't it? Yeah. Who would do that? That's horrible. Gosh. I know. That is horrible. <laughs> wow. Well, it was allegedly only 30 seconds, the amount of time from the first sighting of the iceberg yeah. to the alleged impact. 30 mm. seconds. That's no time at all, is it? It is. And the iceberg was it, a Although people. they could have still shouted before, you know, it's not going to take 30 seconds to register. But did they, they have binoculars, though, as well? That's another issue, because apparently I've read that they didn't, yeah. They didn't have their binoculars with them in the crow's nest. I don't know, to be fair. Carl? Yeah. Is Carl with us? No, Carl, no, no Carl's um, off to get a drink, I think. Oh, right, OK. <laughs> um, yeah. Now, I do know um, that, allegedly, according to and recounted by Titanic survivors, they reckon the estimated height of the iceberg above the water was 50 to 100 feet. Yeah, 100 feet. Mm. That's a big old iceberg. It is, and, you know, most of the icebergs, it's only the, I think it's like a third of it is actually visible above water. 
Yeah. There's a whole load more underneath underneath the water yeah. line. Because with icebergs, they sort of turn around as they float around. So when it gets top heavy, it will literally turn around. So the heaviest part of it is underwater. So you only get to see like a tiny bit of it anyway. Yeah. Isn't it only 30% you see above the water? I, I think so. Something like that, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, See now, I've heard oh, a, I've ah uh, I've heard a theory about said iceberg. Um, I don't know how true this is. I I can't find any verifiable information. But they reckon that when the iceberg was born, as it were, like it broke off from the shell, uh, the ice shelf, and they reckon it was the elus. I can't even say this word. Illicit ice shelf in Greenland mm-hmm. is the most likely place. That the point it broke off was the point of launch of the Titanic. That's a theory I've heard, guys. What do we reckon on that one? How do they work that out? <laughs> that's a that's a real synchronicity. If that's what's happened. It is. It's, that's a really strange synchronicity. If that's what's happened, <laughs> well, I, I agree with that. that <laughs> but it, oh, I think yeah, they so, made it up. It, it yeah. would make it. It adds to the myths and the legends of it, doesn't it? It does, doesn't it? Yeah. What do you reckon on that one, Carl? Um, Have you heard of that one before? I have heard of that scenario and if you can prove that is that's a completely mind-blowing thing that the moment the iceberg broke off the shelf to the moment the launch happened the that means in some sort of way that it was destined to meet at some point in time well if you look at it in that way if you want to look at it in the yeah in the woo-woo way I suppose, yeah. in the synchronicity Big way. Thing. It <laughs> is very strange, isn't it? If that's true, as I couldn't find any verifiable information on that particular one. I don't know how whoever came up with that one, I don't know how they managed to work that out. If it's true, it could be just one another one of those myths and legends that surround the Titanic. And there are many, many myths and legends that surround the Titanic and many theories as to what happened on that particular night. And yes, we are learning more and more and more every single day. But... But, but, Kerry, there's one... (laughs) There's always a but. No, no, I'm I'm talking aspect-wise of nature. These these things that we're learning when better cameras, better submersibles go down to the wreck. But sadly, that what is left is going to give less and less yeah. information to people that dive on it because it can only dive on it in certain times, etc., etc. That we're always going to have that question yeah, about that's... what actually happened because the wreck is slowly, slowly deteriorating in, in the sea salt and whatever. Yeah, it's so just water deteriorating. We, we can believe what we believe. You can talk about what you believe. You have these theories. You have these conspiracies. You, you can do whatever you want to say, but I've seen documentaries where they've mapped the seabed and they, the, what, the recent one that happened recently where they basically drew, they dredged all the water off so you were left with what's left and seeing the the wreckage debut yeah uh, i've seen that one they, oh, it's amazing to watch it's it. fascinating and think, absolutely and you, fascinating. and you think and you when you look at it and you see the speed this front end hit the seabed to the speed the back end hit yes it there was a difference in that too wasn't there yeah because of the weight and the the, the, the engines the, uh-huh. everything else and whatever and look at the damage field that's happened until you you actually think okay fair enough you're just looking at it and just think okay there's conspiracy theories all over the place but there's also facts and truths about it Mm-hmm. I mean, the front part. I, I heard that the front part hit at thirty-five. Hit the seabed at thirty-five miles per hour, and the bow, the back bit, which was the bit that tipped up right at the end, where you see Jack and Rose clinging, clinging, um, hit at fifty oh, miles. Oh, but they per weren't hour. there really. <laughs> fifty We're miles an hour. Two people on that door. <laughs> we come back yeah. to that. But, <laughs> yes. But that the the main philosophy about 
behind that bit of movie memorabilia or whatever you want to call it is that the the the, the part that broke off had the engines that were, uh, weighed the most, so it dragged it down quicker and had a bigger impact than the back end, which is shorter than what we thought it was, that basically sort of drifted from side to side before it hit the bottom. That's why that end is in better condition quality than the front end which is like two and a half three miles apart yeah there's the it's a huge debris here. field isn't it debris field <coughs> when you when they looked at it when they found it it's a huge debris field no, could you imagine massive. though when you was down in that uh, the remote sub and it actually found the wreck could you imagine the, the ship above when they're looking at the cameras and they first get that first glimpse of the wreckage could you imagine how that would have felt Oh, absolutely, and you look, you you can see it on YouTube. You can see the first moments, the first submersible found mm-hmm. found the actual wreck because at one stage you people didn't know the exact point was. Now it's pinpointed, but that wreck is moving to this day because of the ways the sea works yeah. back and back and forth. So that thing is moving constantly. Yeah, even if so it's like it's small amounts, it's abuse. still having it's that that movement. <coughs> yeah, crazy. Yeah, and all the bars are still full up as well. It's an incredible thing. And what they're bringing up and what, what's in museums around the world, like plates, knives, forks, people's per, uh, possessions, everything like that. It's amazing to see all these museums. Like you've got the museum in Florida, you've got the museum in California, you've got the museum in Belfast. All these museums have yeah. relics that have been brought up from from the depths mm-hmm. of... Yeah. And it's like three and a half, four and a half miles down or something stupid like that. Not 100% on the exact... No, it's a far depth. way down, isn't it? It's a long way it's down. 12, it's 12,500 feet below the surface. And how many... What's that in miles? Oh, crikey. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> quick, a quick Google conversion. <laughs> you, you, you think that's a long... It's a long way down. It's a long and way these, down. these submersibles going out, there's no human that's gone down to the wreck. There's no human physical divers that swim around. You can't. It. You These can't. All, no, exactly. Because the you practice. can only do it in a in a little yeah yeah submarine. You've got thing, these little you? fucking you've got these little cameras, submersibles, and things like that. But the greatest <laughs> thing that I like about the film and real life is the bit where they bring the submersible around the front end of the boat, and you see the the sharp end where. DiCaprio and Winslet were doing that old bit in the air and <laughs> I'm the king of the world. But you then see that front end and you think oh, you can picture it. Yeah. Oh. It's a very... Uh, one thing James Cameron did in that film was make it um, the iconic imagery um, of yeah, the that... Titanic that everybody thinks of these days. Yeah, but Cameron was making that film for donkey's years before. Oh, gosh, well, yeah. A long time before it actually hit the cinema. This is oh, God, this yeah. was a long term project. Oh yeah, he was one of the major people involved in finding the wreck. Yeah, he was finding everything else, doing yeah. the, the the research about it. Oh, so God, it yeah. wasn't just it wasn't just a film. It was a a life project for. And he still Jack works Cam- on it now. He still works on it yeah. now. I think, yeah. I think he's still still president or something yeah. to do with research. And you can only dive on the wreck. At certain times of the year. Yeah, because of the conditions because in the Atlantic. The yeah, because of the conditions in the Atlantic. Now, I did actually approach James Cameron. Believe it or not. Did you? I did. Because you know me, I yeah. approach all yeah. sorts of people. I did this absolutely yonks and yonks ago. Um, if I wanted him on a show, it would have cost £100,000 for an hour. Clearly, Parasearch yeah. hasn't got that kind of money, which is why he's not on the show. <laughs> hasn't, hasn't he made enough money from the movie? Yeah. I know, that's where, that's the theory I was working with. <laughs> no, 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 that, mo- that movie has taken in over two billion. Pounds. I know, it's the, the, one yeah, of the biggest grossing movies of all grand time. Just to, He needs another hundred grand for another three weeks out there, that's what he wants. 
I know. Oh, right. <laughs> well, it was 14 days allegedly after the coll- collision with the Titanic that the iceberg would probably have disappeared and melted into the Gulf Stream's water. Right, now the night of the Titanic is very well documented. Um, we all know there weren't enough lifeboats. We all know that the death toll was absolutely horrendous um, on that 1, night. 1,502. That's how many people died. Yep. And it was, it, I say, that's well documented. So we're not really going to go into that because we could be here all night just on facts that happened throughout the sinking. Let's have a look at post-disaster. Um, okay. So the distress call goes out. We get the Carpathia come along. It was the only ship that actually responded <laughs> to the SOS call um, that... The- Actual, the SS Californian completely ignored, ignored it. It, did, ignored it, it. It did, yeah. And then it was, Which was then that was the cl- three years later the, by a German yeah, submarine. The thing was, the, the California was the closest vessel to the yeah. Titanic that saw it as oh. the last person that was talking on air recently, and um, they saw they saw the lights, they saw everything. Mm. But they ignored they ignored it because they didn't think that it was serious enough us to move across. True. So, True. Yeah, I, I was adds also... to the adds to the horror of the whole thing, isn't it? I mean, um, the Carpathia was the one that actually was on or went on site and rescued the people, which is why it's got the name. But there were other ships in the locality that yeah. didn't respond or didn't realize what was going on because i've heard one theory that they thought the fireworks going off which was actually the distress calls they thought there were fireworks mm. the problem with the distress call was that um they were using white flares and not red flares which is probably didn't why have there was red... that confusion there yeah they didn't have any red flares on board so they used the white ones and obviously yeah it was mistaken for fireworks <laughs> And there was another ship that was quite close, but because it was doing illegal sealing um, in the area at the time, ignored the the uh, mm. situation, shall we say? Yeah. But I suppose at the end of the day, you just got to look at it. You're going in one direction. There's umpteen vessels going in this direction and whatever. You hear this, that, and the other. It depends on how accurate the message that were coming out of the Titanic at the time. Was it, are we sinking? Was it um, distress call? Or was it just, we're in trouble? Well, the Titanic actual call-out said, SOS, the Morse code this was, SOS Titanic calling, we have struck ice and require immediate assistance. The Titanic was the first ship to use the SOS signal. Yeah. So that could have caused a bit of confusion if they didn't under, didn't know the switch because before they use a CQD. But you've also got to remember, Paul, something else is they say we've hit an iceberg, we're in distress, we need assistance. It, it potentially, they didn't realise mm. how bad it was when that first message went out. And you've also was, got to remember... Was there, was there time to get there? But yeah. you also have to remember that the number of radio operators on the Carpathia was only one. <coughs> now, yeah. the, the time was as, uh, two, it's 25 minutes past midnight, um, which was actually the time he was started to finish his duty. He was actually unlacing his boots when the Titanic SOS call actually arrived. Now, if he had, if it had been literally a few minutes earlier, um, sorry, if it had been later the Carpathia would not have actually come to the rescue. No. Because well, he wouldn't would have, have been, got it, because it, it would have been booked be off. Because oh. these boats don't stop on a sixpence. You're thinking, that, okay, there's a dis- distress call. You're 15 miles in front of mm-hmm. me. By the time I actually slow down, I'm going to be there with you. Yeah. Or you could be past it already. By the time you turn, there's another ship going to be coming in. So mm-hmm. there's all these nautical things you've got to take into into account. That Was, wasn't the Carpathia four hours away? Well, 
This is another. Yeah, like, this this is actually an amazing thing because Arthur Rostrum, who was the captain of the Carpathia, now his ship was only designed to travel at the maximum speed of fourteen knots. On the way to Titanic, he actually pushed his ship to achieve seventeen knots. Throughout that time, they saw six further icebergs. So he actually put his own ship at risk, and it took three point five hours for the Carpathia to arrive on scene. Wow. And you, you, okay, you look at the film, it happened in whatever, and there's these great sen- um, moments on film that you mm-hmm. see this. You imagine that in real life, slowly happening in front of you. Yeah. It's not anything like, it's oh, horrendous. it's like, I will always love you and all that sort of Oh, no, you've got no money of that. It's a pure fight for survival. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're, 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 whether, whether the back end came out of the water like it showed on film, whether it did this, that and the other, which there's so many beliefs that the, the ship of the breakup happened in a completely different way because of the weight of the engines, because of the weight of the water that was rushing in. You don't know how things were going to happen, but at the end of the day, the, descri- the, the emergency call that was put out was picked up on by a couple of boats that were hours away. Mm. By the time they got there, there ain't going to be much left of what actually happened. There's not going to be a boat sliding up out there and sinking down slowly, as you see in the film. Oh, this- no. But having said that, you know, it is a film. You've got to keep in mind it's a film. It's blockbuster. Yeah. It's, yeah. You know, it is. there's only so much you could do. And he actually wanted to focus on the actual Titanic, not the rescue side of things i mean to be fair to uh, the carpathia at te- they arrived on the scene at four o'clock in the morning on the 15th at 10 past four in the morning was the time that the first lifeboat was actually brought aboard the carpathia by eight thirty in the morning that was the time that the last lifeboat so you can imagine the well you can imagine now Again, Arthur Rostrum, captain of the Carpathia, and this is a quote, <coughs> said he was devoutly thankful that the long race was over, but with that feeling was a veritable ache which the now certain knowledge of the liner's loss brought. There was no sign of her, and below was the first boat containing survivors. You can imagine mm-hmm. that um, <coughs> that, uh, that it feeling. It must have been a horrendous scene to come across. It's like you've got no boat there. Yeah. You've just got the lifeboats bobbing around. You've got debris. You've got which would have happened. You've got to, would have been, had people in the water. But then again, you've got to realise how quickly a human <coughs> passed in that sort of water temperatures. Mm-hmm. So was it just bodies that were dead but floating, mm-hmm. frozen? Well, five minutes was, was it... the average expectancy life expectancy exactly. in the water at that and time. And you're talking five hours before they turned up. So exactly. whatever they saw in the water... If it was in the water, there's not <coughs> as much chance that those people are going to be alive, so they're going to None. concentrate on the lifeboats. There wasn't enough life lifeboats on the boat, which is proven and written. And in- some of them weren't even filled to capacity. I, be- I believe there was yeah. one lifeboat that only had 12 yeah. people in it. They launched them because they thought they could think, because they were told or they believed this boat would never sink. Exactly. Now, the number of passengers and crew aboard the Carpathia was 700. The amount of people rescued by the Carpathia was actually 706. As they awoke to the scene of the tragedy, the passengers aboard the Carpathia assisted the survivors of the Titanic, which I think is just... <laughs> you're going to, aren't you? You're not, not going to. Um, they comforted the rescued, giving them food, drinks, spare clothing, and even gave up their cabins to accommodate the survivors. Um, whilst they made the return trip to New York. Mm. What a scary, scary, emotional time that would have been. Uh huh. Now, there was. <sighs> we, we, you, you mentioned about what they actually came across. The actually only dead bodies seen in the water by Captain Rostrum from the Carpathia was only one, actually. I can't believe that. Well, this is on, on the actual official Titanic site. I know, I know, I know that. But the thing I can't believe is that there's going to be one body that there was seen. That was actually I seen. personally, what, what I want to say is, I personally don't know the reaction to a human body and 
freezing cold water and how whether it sinks or whether it gets floats or whatever but i'm sorry but the thing in my eyes was if that boat's gone down there's going to be wreckage there's going to be people that have jumped overboard they're going to be mm-hmm. hanging on a wreckage that sort of stuff that's what is in my head it would yeah. be a horrendous that's what you stuff. would imagine that's what you would yeah. imagine isn't it i mean we can only go on accounts that um are actually out there and i say mm-hmm. i'm looking at the official titanic website um for a lot of these facts now, post disaster, that you know, the White Star Line actually chartered a number of ships to go and re- retrieve bodies of the victims. Now, also, you've got to remember that bodies ain't going to stay in the same place. There are, you know, tides and water movement. They're going to be dispersed, aren't they? When you think no, it's the, miles apart, you can some imagine. Some are going to sink as well. You would imagine some would sink. You would imagine only twenty three percentage of the dead whose bodies were recovered. There was only twenty three percent. Three hundred and six bodies were found. Yeah. That's a quick question: How many people were on the Titanic? Anybody? We said it earlier. Um, oh, um, I can't remember. Right. I'm I looking. <laughs> looking, we're looking. Uh, uh, there's two thousand. Going back in our results. Twenty three. 2023, and how many people survived? Only about 700, 706. Yeah, oh, so 706, good, wasn't it? You've got a good 1,500 people that were either below decks yeah. that couldn't get out. Yeah, yeah, because there's that. Were on decks. I'm sorry, yeah. I can't believe they only saw one body in the water. Well, no. that, it, I it say, that is... Mm. I find there that hard to believe, too. There was honeymooning couples in the voyage as well. There was. How awful yeah. for your honeymoon. Well, oh, that's a trip of a lifetime, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, yeah. only, I say, and only 23% of the dead were recovered. Which, mm. And they, these came out, actually, of Nova Scotia, didn't they? They came out of Halifax Nova, um, in... Yeah. Canada. Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia. Yeah. Um, now, this, brings it to, this brings it to a, a little bit of a question. There's the wreckage on the deck of the sea. On the same. Should you, should you, yeah, exactly. Mm. Sh- should you leave that as a memorial to the dead? No. Should you not I think this go is, and investigate I... it? Should you not send things down to it? Should you just think it's where there's I think this is why they... people's graves are? I think this is why they decided that they wouldn't try and raise the wreck. Yeah. Or parts. Yeah. I think they were going to leave it as a much, you know, monument to yeah, people that died. I don't think they could ever ever raise the wreck because it was in such a bad state. Looking at the front end, which I watched on TV, mm. that front end you're not going to you're not going to raise it. The back end, possibly, but at the end of the day, I still don't think the you wreck, should. I'm no, I don't that, think they. That's it. That's people's graves at the end of the day. Yeah, I, I, th- I believe they, they, that it should be left mm, intact where left it alone. is, to be yeah. fair. Mm. Anyway, going back to the recovery of the bodies, 800 nautical miles, which is actually 920 miles, the uh, CS Mackie Bennett needed to travel to actually get to the scene of the disaster. It actually took them four days to get to the scene of the disaster. On the 20th of April, bearing in mind the day it actually happened... Um, yeah. was the date they actually started to recover bodies from the sea. And how many did they pick up? Um, they had quite an awful lot. 306 bodies were recovered by the CS Mackey. Bay. What I would say to that is, there's one thing, is it's when a body is submerged in water, they bulloped and then, yes, they, they, then they fucked up. So I would say they were in the ship that went down, and then they've expanded and they've come up. Yeah. They only actually carried on the um, Mackie Bennett um, embalming supplies that could cope with 70 bodies and only 100 coffins. They also carried 100 tonnes of ice to store the recovered bodies. Where did that ship then dock after they picked up the bodies? Halifax. As in Nova, Nova, yeah, Nova, Nova Scotia. Scotia. Yeah. yeah, which is in Canada. A third of those bodies were actually buried at sea because they were absolutely, um, as you just said, bloated and unrecognisable. 
um, and they actually carried 28 pound iron bars which were used to help bury uh, bury uh, bury the bodies at sea um, now on the first day 51 bodies were recovered that was 46 men four women and one baby boy oh and 24 of those were buried at sea because they were so disfigured. That's horrible, isn't it? That is horrible. That is. Uh, one really interesting factor is um, that the bodies um, were treated in regards to their class, whether they were first, second or third class. First class passengers were embalmed and placed into coffins and they were then stored in the rear cabin. Second and third class victims were embalmed and wrapped in canvas and stored in the forward cabin locker. And crew members that were recovered were just placed in the ice field hold. That's horrible. They even kept a class system after they died. Yeah. Yeah. But that's time of like that. That to be fair, you yeah. can look back into the nineteen. You know. Yeah, you've that's got, true. You've got to look back at what it was like. Back in that day and age, in 1912, it was very class-driven, wasn't it? It was. Um, it doesn't yeah. make it right. I mean, I'm not saying it was right. No. Now, whilst the search for the bodies was taking place, um, the Mayflower curling rink was actually prepared as a temporary morgue and an area was screened off to become an embalming section after which any bodies that were not already named. So when they got the bodies on board, they had to search their clothing to see if any there was any way to, to help the identification process. Now, actually, some of the processes and um, uh, procedures that were actually evolved throughout this particular um, situation were very integral post disaster for other disasters in how they um identify and treat bodies um it the guy who did that i can't remember his name but he, he became very very famous because of the procedures he put in place in forms of identify how to identify um bodies he took things like um facial scars on the bodies birthmarks he looked for all sorts of things not just search the body, see if there was any identifications in their wallet or whatever. He he was actually quite integral in regards to that side of things. Mm. Which, I'm, I'm, but on. they don't they say that the, the biggest learning lessons are usually coming off the back of a major disaster. Yeah, it it does. Absolutely. I mean if one learns by their mistakes that you know um and that's the same really, isn't it? I mean yeah, you do, you do. You can learn from things like that. Any, any disaster, you learn. You learn from. Mm-hmm. You know, even like incidents like the nine eleven twin towers. We we've learned a lot about that disaster and how to try and avoid it in the future. So you you learn. Yeah, yeah, I think you do. Any any major disaster, there's a huge learning curve in how to deal with it. And every disaster, particularly when you've never had this kind of level disaster before, you know what I mean? Yeah. Bearing in mind, they're dealing with situations that they've never come across before. This has never happened before to this extent, to this, this no. magnitude. You know what I mean? It's absolutely horrendous. Um, yeah. And you're having to deal with situations that you've never come across before. Mm. Mm. I, I know um, the the second officer, um, Charles Herbert Lightroller, in in the film is the guy that shot the gun. In um, oh the, yeah, the movie. yeah 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 yeah. He he went on after the, after the Titanic. He got um, a, a, his own motor motorboat, and he rescued soldiers from Dunkirk. Wow! Um, during World War Two, and yeah, correct, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, and the boat that he had is actually moored at um, Ramsgate Maritime Museum. Yeah, yeah I was it is. Say, I was say it was at, it's at Ramsgate. It was part of the recent film about Dunkirk. Yeah, it was. Yeah. When you think and about it's called it, the sun, it... it's called the Sundowner, and yeah. it's yeah. still still at Ramsgate. So if anyone wants yeah. to go and see it, absolutely, it's still there. Yeah, he was one of the first people that jumped to when. They asked when the the call went out when uh, uh, Dunkirk was, we need boats to go and rescue our soldiers. 
Yeah. Yeah. He's first people in his boat. Popping going off. He's like, come on, let's go. He was like yeah. one of yeah. what were you were class as a true hero. I mean, he, oh, his actions yeah. Yeah, on the night of the sinking, his illustrious career through the navy, and then what he did for Dunkirk. I mean, that is somebody that is freaking awesome in my view. Absolutely. But can I just flip it slightly? Um, <laughs> of course. What about the experiences where you get people reporting seeing the Titanic in modern day? The well, ghost like ghostbusters when it what, turns. As in like a ghost, a ghost ship? No, no, I'm not talking about the ghost. No, I'm not talking about the ghostbusters. <laughs> all that sort of malarkey. I'm talking about these things that people say about ghost ships and what this and the Titanic and this, that, and the other. What what are they actually seeing? How are they actually manifesting these things? Oh in gosh! Your, in your, now there's in a your question. Office? Um. Ooh, now there's a question. <laughs> um, oh my goodness, where do we go with that one, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, do you know what? I mean, I I would have thought that if anyone um, was to be passing the the same area where the Titanic's saying, that they could just be seeing another boat. Hmm. Mm, I know, think, yeah, the Titanic is pretty iconic from what we've seen. So is it a... Oh, Ashley Nibb's going to love me. Um, is it a physical manifestation of what you want to see? Is it a telepathic imprintation yeah. that you're picking yeah, up Kenny, on? You look at cruise ships now. They're yeah. roughly the same size as, as the Titanic would have been. They're absolutely That's true. huge. That's true. So they could be seeing that and going, oh, it's Titanic. And it's not, it's just the Disney cruise. (laughs) I don't know, but that is a whole different topic. Anyway, guys, we've been an hour and a half into this topic. I think it's time to wrap this up. Um, Thank you so much. Can I put out a little positive thing from all of this? The last remaining survivor of the disaster was Melvina Dean. She died on the May the 31st, 2009, age 97. But she was actually only two months old time. Two months old oh. at the time of the disaster. Oh, and she was her. rescued. So she had a full life after it. I love that. That's a nice positive note to end the show on. Um, I hope you guys out there have listened and enjoyed this pop-up show commemorating the sinking of the Titanic. We hope we brought some interesting facts into the um, realm for you that you may not have heard before. Don't forget, tomorrow evening we have the Spirit Dimension with myself, Claire Hinks, and the lovely Cheryl McGregor coming to the studio 9 o'clock live for you. Monday I'll go live on the (coughs) Power Search Radio group page and give you a rundown of the the week's shows ahead. Um, Now, good luck, Penny. Penny is currently in Brighton getting rest for her 10k run if you would like to support her it's one of your last chances to do so and pop over to her gofundme page that's over on the parasearch radio group page um she will be really grateful she's going to be running hard like a mad woman tomorrow from all at parasearch good luck penny i know you won't need it i know the work you've put into that so good luck with that one you're going to be absolute. you're going to smash it at the ballpark i just know you are Also, on the Parasearch Radio group page, we have a competition running at the moment. It is for a tarot reading with myself, um, all done via Skype, so you don't have to come to my home. Um, If you'd like to enter, pop over to the Parasearch Radio group page. You'll be able to find all the terms and conditions. And all you have to do is be a liker of the Parasearch Radio group page and put it on. Don't forget, and put your name on, rather, Now, don't forget, we have shows on SoundCloud. We have shows on Podbean. We have shows on YouTube. We have shows on the Spreaker app. We have a brand spanking new website called parasearchradio.com. Pop over there. Check out all the information that is over there on that website. And on that note, guys, thank you so much for a fascinating discussion on the Titanic tonight. It's been really good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I... Although it's a 
horrible disaster, I always find the subject incredibly fascinating. And on that note, we bid you all a very farewell and good night. And we'll see you tomorrow at 9pm. Good night. Good night. Good night. We're going to finish on the Titanic's flute sound. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Don't forget to join us for more shows throughout the week. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web to keep up to date with all the shows right here on Parasearch Radio.